Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. This time we'll continue our reading of 30 Toes Short. Buck Jack awoke to the summery smell of cut grass. His horse belly growled. It was the smell of cooking mulch, grass stew, de rigueur for breakfast in the dedicated cavalry. He sat up and looked around. He lay on a mat next to the pile of bags not yet loaded. He had slept with a drunken brownie in a box a yard from his head, but his luck seemed to have held. It was 6.30. He did not feel sleepy. He did feel stiff and hungry. He got up and picked his way through the caravansary, now much less packed, to where a standard cavalryman was stirring the mulch pot for his dedicated brothers. He collected a bowl and, to avoid thinking about the taste, looked around. Mulch might smell nice, but you had to be a lot horsier than buckjack for it to taste good. Still, it was good for the inner equine. A handful of men and women, infantry and standard cavalry, were up and breakfasting. Fells dozed. Charlie Horse stood near the wall doing stretches. Horsepower lay as still as a dark hill. His muscles saddled him with expectations, and he had worked almost feverishly. He lay back to back with Danny. Captain Fletcher and Lieutenant Sanders sat in a corner, using crates as impromptu desks, doing paperwork. Buckjack got a tray, loaded it with three mugs of coffee and a plate of donuts and scrambled eggs. Both stomachs want breakfast, he quoted to himself from the Narnia books, and made his way over to them. Ah, thank you kindly, Wendon. Excuse me. Ah, thank you kindly, Weldon, said Fletcher when he arrived and put down the tray. Did you sleep at all, sir? Buck Jack asked. With these joints? A bit of a nap. Horses don't sleep much. Old men don't sleep much. Old man horses sleep very little. Fletcher had been in there hauling all night. It was part of his motivational program of, surely you young Broncos can keep up with an old plug like me. Sir, is it all right if I look around the town some more? Certainly, just be back here by eight. Carlin is already out there if you're looking for him. Buckjack had been wondering. It was like Fletcher to guess that. Thank you, sir. He saluted, took his own coffee cup and a couple of donuts, and picked his way out of the caravansary. He found Carlin nursing his own coffee, yawning as he walked, apparently orbiting the block. Want to poke around some more? Buck Jack asked. Sure, Carlin answered through the next yawn. Get the blood circulating. And yet, half asleep on his hooves, he had got around to chase, changing last night's t-shirt for his dress jacket and custom hat. He was evidently set on stepping out even before Buck Jack appeared. He downed the coffee, shivered his flanks, switched his tail, and the prance was back in his step. Showtime. He let Buck Jack pick the stage, though, that is, lead the way. For where I am is the show, Buck Jack murmured to himself, and where the show is, there must I ever be. What was that crack? Nothing. No, it wasn't. That was your riff on Faust, where Mephistopheles says, for where we are is hell, and where hell is, there must we ever be. He gave a foxy grin at Buck Jack's expression. It always surprises people when I know stuff like that. The smile retreated. So you meant what by that? I, sorry, it's just, you seem inseparable from, from, you did let Charlie Horse nickname you Style. Carlin nodded, conceding the half-articulate point. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, it's my hobby. I mean, I know my looks are nothing special unless I make an effort, so I do. It's something I have left from before. His voice sank briefly, and Buck Jack got the feeling he hadn't meant to say, have left. I mean, he continued more firmly, it's not like the old life never happened. We all keep stuff. Yep, Buck Jack agreed quickly. They were back at the road now. Buck Jack led the way across, past the Bethos, no longer a novelty, toward Harry Morley's berth. Carlin showed no surprise and made no comment. A few minutes later, the coffee cups had been disposed of, the donuts eaten, fish sandwiches bought and eaten at a stand, and three new cups of coffee purchased. They clattered down the boardwalk and onto the pier, and there was Harry Morley. 
His locker was open. There was a mirror in the door, and he sat before it on a folding stool, shaving. He had not looked up at their noise. He was probably used to all manner of traffic around his berth. Mr. Morley, Buck Jack called. Harry looked up at them, blankly at first. Then he recognized Buck Jack and st started in surprise. Jack, he said in a wheeze. Then normally, Jack Weldon? There were gill slits at his waist where fish met man. They had been open, relaxed when he wheezed, held shut when he spoke clearly. Yes, sir, Jack Weldon, sir. How are you doing? Fine, fine, said the double amputee, because that's what you say. Let's sit over there. There's more room. He pointed to a wider stretch of pier coming off the row of lockers at a right angle. Buck Jack and Carlin clattered down the last few steps, then onto the pier. They sat, then Carlin scooched up and dangled his forelegs in the water. After a moment's consideration, Buck Jack followed suit. In the meantime, Harry quickly finished his shave. He nicked himself in his haste, dabbed with a bit of cotton, then swung himself along the pier by his arms, tossing the cotton in a bin along the way. Soon he was seated next to Buck Jack, his tail dangling in the water next to Buck Jack's forelegs. There was a silence while everyone took stock of each other. Carlin, expert in smiles, gave a friendly one to Harry, then blew on his coffee and politely did not appear to stare at anyone. Buck Jack took his first good look at Harry since, well, all the changes. He looked very much as Buck Jack remembered, down to the waist at least, a lean man of middle size with ropey muscles and a long face. He was heavily tanned on the back, less so on chest and belly. His face was perhaps more weathered than it had been and looked beaten. Below the waist and the gills, the body was a six-foot fishtail with fine smoke-gray scales and fins of dark brown, the same color as his hair. A pair of fins below the waist were presumably what was left of his legs. Buck Jack broke the silence by presenting Harry with two cups of coffee. This one's black and this one's cream and sugar, he said, offering the choice. Harry thanked him and took the cream and sugar one. While Buck Jack had been studying the merman, Harry had been studying the centaur. Buck Jack remembered going home for Christmas where old acquaintances had stared and stared helplessly, their gazes sweeping from the familiar body to the unfamiliar one and back, which was what he himself had been doing to Harry. So you, Harry began, then trailed off. He'd never been a big talker, Buck Jack remembered. Yeah, I did, he replied. He had taken the poor man by surprise, so he decided it was up to him to get the conversation rolling. About a year ago, and this is Julian Carlin. He's my classmate. How do you do, Mr. Morley, said Carlin. Harry nodded and timidly smiled. We're sailing on the Bethos for our training expedition. I, um, I thought you were going to marry that Donna girl. Buck Jack was a little surprised to find the subject no longer stung. I thought so too, but she didn't. Harry nodded, his mouth forming a silent O, then glanced again at the equine body that was now the greater part of Buck Jack. Clearly he was putting two and two together the way everyone back home had. None of my business, of course, he mumbled. Everyone knows back on Oakwood Street, Buck Jack replied. No reason you shouldn't. But you know my family, my dad always hauling us off to distant parts. Well, now I've made distant parts my career. I remember your brother changed too. Yes, sir, gave me the idea. Did Harry look a bit sadder? Did he not like hearing about more transformations? Maybe especially of people he had known, even if only slightly? Maybe he wouldn't be looking sad at all if Buck Jack had stayed away. Damn. I wanted to look you up and see how you were doing. Silence again. Please, Harry, fill in the blank. Just as Buck Jack was considering rephrasing this as a direct request, please tell me how you're doing, Harry replied. Oh, pretty good. I work for one of the fishing fleets, Flotte de la Côte Nord, in the Mer Crew. School fish, do the lobster pots, check hulls, keep lines from fouling, whatever can best be done below. Tilly and I have a nice little place up on Route Huge. 
Buck Jack remembered the merman on crutches last night and wondered if Harry's place had more than one floor. The kids like their school. We try to keep in touch with folks back on Oakwood Street. Well, that's mostly Tilly. He stared at the cardboard cup in his hands. You see Walter Cosser lately? Buck Jack raced his brain. Horses have good memories, and therefore his had improved. Yes, sir, for a little bit, when I was home for Christmas. The day I washed up at Sturt, first person I saw was Walter Cosser. He brought me a cup of coffee first thing after he ran to fetch Tilly. That and his hand were the first warmth I'd felt in more than a year. He and his wife, they helped us through a lot. He's a good guy, Buck Jack agreed, but there had been a cost. Walter Cosser and he had seen each other across the street for maybe five seconds. Cosser had blanched and turned away, shuddering. It would be foolish to say Cosser was as upset by Harry's transformation as Harry himself or Tilly, but clearly such things now made his blood run cold. Another silence. Buck Jack swished his forelegs in the water, noting the cool feel around his pasterns and the soles of his hooves, even the trickling under the hooves. He tried to compare the sensation to the feel it had on bare feet, human feet. Or should he compare it to the feel on his hands? Early on, his forelegs had sometimes seemed like arms. It didn't matter. He could no longer remember how his old body felt. None of them could. He supposed Harry couldn't remember legs at all. So how do you know each other? Carlin asked. I mean, I know you lived on the same street, but beside that? Not really much more than that, Buck Jack admitted. But Oakwood Street is all there is to Grand Normandy and Sturk, or to anything sundered. And it's only, what, a couple of dozen houses? So everyone saw each other all the time. Harry smiled with a bit more warmth than the merely social smiles until now. First thing I remember about you, I was a young fellow working the docks, and you and your brother and sister were fooling around down there, larking on and off a ferry or something. Come to think of it, your dad must have been getting ready for one of those trips he took you on. You weren't doing anything bad, but the three of you made me nervous, for your safety. We'd just had our first, or maybe Tilly was expecting, that was probably why. Mum and dad must have been around somewhere, said Buck Jack, feeling like just Jack, or even Jackie, again. Harry nodded and continued. At some point, the three of you were sitting on the pier, dabbling your feet, just like this, and I teased you. Said the crabs would pinch your toes. Well, not just like this. We're about 30 toes short for that now. To Buck Jack's surprise, Harry's smile turned wistful, but did not go away. You didn't believe me. I think we knew you were kidding, said Buck Jack, who did not at all remember the incident. But he remembered endless sunny times at the docks, flitting about, how tiny that body would seem to him now, and the smell of salt and engines and the glitter of water, the creak of wood and the many voices of the waves, endless games with Jeff and Chloe and other kids, ignoring grown-ups almost all the time in childhood's own sundering. The games were forgotten, but not the light and voices and sounds. You know the water, Mr. Carlin? Harry asked. Carlin nodded. London docks, mudlarkin' on the Thames, kind of like Buckjack here. Nothing like you, of course, Mr. Morley. Oh, yes, I know the water now, agreed Harry, sadly. Carlin had probably meant the remark for a compliment, but Buckjack found himself wanting to push him in and let the crabs pinch his toes. Idiot. Buck Jack? Harry asked, turning the subject. I'm a buckskin, Buck Jack explained. That's my coat pattern. So, Buck Jack. Carlin nicknamed everyone else in class. We call him Style. Carlin smiled and tipped his custom made hat. There's Horsepower and Trick Shot and Bronco Daddy and Charlie Horse, he said. And I used to be Mr. Paint. The gosh compliment was washed away. Harry nodded and smiled. Then he cocked his head, listening. Excuse me, he said, and vanished into the water. A moment later, a small rowboat came out from under the dock, pushed by Harry. He reached in, pulled out a coil of rope, and tossed it to Buckjack. Make fast, please, he said. 
While Buck Jack tied the rope to one post, Harry heaved himself out and tied another rope to the next post so that the rowboat was tethered both fore and aft. He expelled water from his gills, then said, I heard the kids down the road. They'll be here with Tilly in a minute. It's not a school morning, so they'll be wanting a ride. The kids, I mean. That's something we have left from before, giving them rides. This is even the same boat we had at Sturk. Of course, now I don't row it for them, I just pull it. But they like that fine. We go further and faster. That's nice, Buck Jack ventured. Last Christmas, my brother and I gave our family rides. Of course, he reflected, they had been celebrating his transformation and showing off. They loot, Carlin burst out suddenly. Buck Jack and Harry stared at him. You gotta count your loot. You have been in a fight and maybe you lost, but that doesn't mean you didn't come away with some loot. Carlin's accent was noticeably more Londonian. Loot, like, like not everyone's happy to take the Sagitta, but some had to, so they'd rather not be here, and his hand came down on the planks where the half-men sat, but they can still count their loot, like being big and strong and tough and fast, that's loot, and you, you can breathe water and swim faster than any man simple, and you're cold-proof, and you can learn sea magic and stuff, so that's your loot. Buck Jack realized his mouth was hanging open. He closed it. Harry had collected himself sooner and now nodded politely. Make the best of it, look on the bright side. That's right, we try. The very courtesy of the agreement in its mildness made Buck Jack think of the phrase, damning with faint praise. This talk of loot was a little like telling Harry he was lucky to be saving money on pants and shoes. Carlin also caught the lukewarm temperature of the reply. He stared down at the water and kicked his forelegs, splashing. Well, here's Tilly and the kids, Harry said. Buck Jack looked up to the boardwalk. There was Tilly Morley looking down at them in puzzlement. She pushed an empty wheelchair in front of her, presumably for after the boating. To her right and left were a young girl and boy in swimsuits, also staring. Look who's here, called Harry, and fortunately, fortunately supplied the answer, since Buck Jack had known Tilly even less than Harry. John Weldon, and this is his friend Mr. Carlin. Hello, John, Tilly answered in a cautious tone. Mary Cosser said you'd done the change in her Christmas letter. I hadn't thought, but of course you'd be coming through here. How are you? Fine, ma'am, he tipped his hat. Carlin tipped his, too, and smiled, but the smile had not regained its usual stage light shine. Harry then did a short three-point crawl with hands and tail over to the steps. He hauled himself up on the handrails like a gymnast, ascended as if he was racing, then perched on the rail of the boardwalk, all apparently to give Tilly a very domestic and respectable kiss. The athletics were done with an ease that argued practice. He's showing off, Buck Jack murmured to Carlin, and now it was his smile that was brighter. He's showing off to his girl. There was an indulgent note in Tilly's smile that indicated she knew this. He's interested in salvage, not loot, and that's something he salvaged. Yeah, let's go, he has rowboats to pull. They climbed the stairs and said their goodbyes. Harry said he hoped they would see each other again soon, or at least when the Bethos returned. Tilly was polite the way one is to strangers. The children repeated their courtesies dutifully, anxious for Dad to get back down in the water and launch. Buck Jack led the way down the boardwalk, then off onto the road, away from the Bethos, past the fishing docks, toward the distant lighthouse. As usual, Carlin soon pulled ahead, but he was silent, and there was no prance to his gait. Buck Jack thought hard for a bit, then said, I like your loot idea. Didn't score much with Harry. Yeah, I'm sorry, because that was your best shot, wasn't it? You worked on that, hadn't you? You'd thought, you'd thought through that for a long time. I could tell. Carlin dropped back a pace, bringing himself level with Buck Jack, and stared at him indignantly. The phrase, what the hell, was clearly written in his face. Buck Jack remembered something Fletcher had said in a martial arts class. Screw sportsmanship, hit the man when he's down. What better time? Carlin wasn't his opponent. If anything, he felt friendlier toward him than ever. 
but Carlin had steadfastly avoided revealing his background, and now looked like the chance for Buckjack the Explorer to explore Carlin's past. When Carlin said nothing, Buckjack started again. Fun my ass. What? All you've ever said about why you joined was that it looked like fun. Okay, but any fun involved is your loot. You're making the best of some bad situation. Well, guess again, Weldon. I just wanted to say something encouraging to Morley. Tried to buck him up and blew it. Yeah, I've thought about bad transformations. How could I not when each of us has a different reason for joining? Guys don't do this under ordinary circumstances, and just two of us decided we wanted to be centaurs. So you didn't just want to change for fun. Yeah, I did. You just said not. There's two of us who simply wanted to be transformed, you said. There's Danny. It's a family tradition for him, and he worships his big brother, who changed. And there's Charlie Horse, who's openly said he didn't like his old personality and wanted to give himself more... What's the word he likes? Moxie. I wanted to install a stallion in my soul, he said. Very poetic, our class scientist can get. Yes, but I gather he'd never have said that out loud to anyone before he changed. So Charlie Horse and Danny are the two who just thought becoming centaurs would make them happy. Paul changed to save his sanity. Horsepower changed to save his life. I changed to start over. And you? I miscounted. You misspoke. You were accidentally too candid. Style, I've lived with you for over a year. I don't know the details, but we all know you didn't want to be changed. I never said no, you were very careful about that. But you couldn't police your face 24-7, or the tone of your voice, or your attitude generally. You like to be too tough for sympathy, but I've seen you being sorry for Fells, and even for Charlie Horse and me once in a while. So I know you can do it, and I just saw you being sorry for Harry, sympathizing. It's been a futlin year, Style, and I can tell you were pushed into the cavalry as surely as Harry was pushed off that dock in Sturk. Style, I'm chewing on you like this because I'm your friend and I want to know what's wrong. Stiff-faced, you're entitled to your deductions. Carlin's walk accelerated, nearing the point of breaking into a trot, running away. Buckjack caught up. And you're entitled to some sympathy yourself. Why? What good would it do? There's no going back. We're up on hooves for life, or longer. For all I know, I'll make a four-legged ghost. He doubled his fists and kicked in mid-stride. Oh, you know what good? Revenge, justice. I walked away from women's company, galloped, but you didn't, and you've walked a hard road back, learning how to win them again and make do. I've got my itch to see strange, wild places, but you're a city boy. I've heard you reminisce about London. You love big cities, and how often do the likes of us see those? You're vain. You like to look good, and not like a good-looking monster, though you've run that for all you can. Someone took your old life from you, and I've seen you boiling about it under that lid you keep clamped. And you've every right to boil. So? Come on, I'm nosy. And you've as good as admitted, I admit nothing. I haven't. I can't. Buckjack's father was a trader in a world full of magic. His son took one pace to make the inference. Ah, oath-bound. Of course, bastards. They were nearly at the lighthouse now and almost at the edge of town. Buckjack wheeled back. Would Carlin follow? He did. He kept twice the distance between them, but he did. After a few paces, he stopped scowling and closed the gap. Still no usual half-smile, though. Buckjack scanned the road. Traffic was light this early and still just on foot. Was it also avoiding them? Were they conspicuous, two big arguing monsters? Uh, not yet. Carlin broke the silence. So, since everyone knows I'm not happy about this, why do they think I did it? The popular theory is that you lost a bet, a big bet. And why is that the popular theory? Because you never play poker. Maybe I don't know how, Carlin proposed. Buck Jack shook his head, smiling. You just strike me, us, as the kind of guy who would know. Do you know? Yeah, I know very well. 
I don't play because there's no challenge to it, and I don't want to make myself unpopular, more unpopular. We're all bad? Terrible. The half grin was back. He counted off on his fingers. Horsepower and Danny smile whenever they have good hands. Fels switches his tail whenever he has a bad hand. And Charlie Horse, he's so much glass. Well, yeah. Charles Darnley did not know the rules at all well and kept asking for instructions. How about me? Oh, you are so fuddled. You handle yourself okay, but you blush. Never saw such a blusher, for good or bad hands, which makes it a little trickier, but still. Buck Jack nodded and sighed. His father had mentioned this problem to him back in the days when they thought he would stay in the family business and have to negotiate trade deals. Okay, he said, so you didn't lose a bet. What was it? Carlin maintained a deliberate silence. Oh, come on. You've been fuming and hinting about it ever since I told you about Harry. A trader dealing in enchantments, like Buck Jack's father, ran into oaths in their terms all the time. Buck Jack thought back to all the times he had heard his parents playing Sherlock, as they said, about oaths that might or might not be in the way of a deal and might or might not be secret. What was hinted about and what was left out? He eyed Carlin. Are you afraid to walk back to the caravansary and face Fletcher? No. But you know he can tell if you've broken an oath, so you know you haven't. So this oath isn't that ironclad. I can guess my way around it. Do you even know what the terms of it are? You don't have to say anything. I've known you, man and beast, for a year. If you knew, you'd look glum, but instead you look uneasy. You don't know the exact terms. An oath that fast and sloppy, no way, you don't know the terms at all. Fuddle you, Weldon, get out of my head. You've been taking lessons from Fletcher, even he doesn't pry this much. He didn't have to spend a year in barracks with you. And I'm not receptant, I just know you hardly ever look uncertain, but you do now. It was the way he tucked in his tail just a bit and stopped swinging it. Carlin had had a lifetime to learn to govern his face, but only a year with that tail. A short considering silence, then, it's not even a real oath, is it? It's some other kind of score, a debt or a favor or something. Vague or coerced or... Coerced? He saw alarm in Carlin's eyes, the tail tucked. Right. They were clipping down the middle of the road, Carlin angry, Buck Jack keeping up. Buck Jack scanned the storefronts, saw what he wanted, and took the lead at a determined trot. Carlin trailed now, puzzled as well as irritated. Carlin saw the store Buck Jack was aiming for and halted. Buck Jack took his elbow but got shaken off. Suit yourself, he said, and ducked through the doorway, adding back over his shoulder, run away if you like, I still know where you live. So what kind of store do you go to to get a friend to talk? We'll find out next time.